now live and streaming on various sites. Everyone who signed up to the event should have had a link to, to Slido. So this is how we're going to be seeing what kind of questions you want me to put to our lovely panel today. So put in stuff rather than kind of possibly having a discussion amongst yourselves, try and put in stuff that, I, that kind of pick up on what they're saying in their introductions. And then I can choose those questions and put them to the panel once we've done some opening statements. So the focus of this panel, which is a UK and a Changing Europe event uh, with Labour List as well. This is our fourth event uh, like this this year. Um, we are going to talk about what is radical federalism. So what would it look like and what should be Labour's approach to devolution? Should radical constitutional reform be at the heart of its offer at the next general election? And how, if Labour does finally get back into power in Westminster, could it use the, leaves, the levers of UK government to decentralise power further, which is something that Keir Starmer has talked a lot about. So he talked in the leadership election about a federal UK. He said he would be interested in seeing a new constitutional settlement, large scale devolution of power and resources, a new constitutional consensus, and all built on the principle of federalism. Meanwhile, you know, Boris Johnson has said he thinks that, you know, Scottish devolution has been a disaster, has been the very controversial internal markets bill. Um, so we've got this great contrast in Westminster at the moment, and we're going to talk to people from across our nations a bit about all of this. So we've got, you know, Labour has launched this constitutional commission, which is headed up by Gordon Brown. We haven't heard much from it recently but hopefully we will do soon and in the meantime while it's exploring this stuff we're going to talk about radical federalism in particular so it's a constitutional reform that aims to resolve the internal conflicts within the structure of the uk and to decentralize power um and we've got with us some brilliant speakers to talk about this we've got anas sawa who is obviously the leader of the scottish labor party and a glasgow msp We've got Tracy Braben, who was the Labour MP for Batley and Spen until recently, and then she was elected in May as the first mayor of West Yorkshire, becoming our first female mayor, finally. Um, we've got Mick Antonou, who represents Pontypridd as a member of the Senate in Wales, and he serves as Council General for Wales as well. And we have Professor Nicola McEwen, who is a senior fellow at the UK and the Changing Europe. So I'm going to sort of direct a question to each of you first of all and then I'm going to look at Slido and then I'm going to see other people's questions and put them to you. So to kick us off if you want to mute and unmute every time you want to speak that would be perfect. So Nicola I thought I'd start with you and I wanted to, I wondered whether you could give us kind of an overview of how you would define radical federalism how it could be defined because I'm sure there are different ways and kind of touch on why it's come to the fore in politics recently and why Labour might be interested or not interested in it as a proposal. I thought you might come to me to ask me that um, and the first thing I would say is that there is no analytical category called radical federalism this is a political idea slogan perhaps an ambition and um, so the other members of the panel are probably better placed to answer what they think they mean by radical federalism. But if I can just say something about federalism, um, essentially what we mean by federalism is something that balances unity and diversity. So a commitment to unity, but embracing diversity uh, across the same country. Translate that into a constitutional arrangement and you're looking at a federation or a federal system which would um, divide and share uh, powers between different tiers of government. In the UK context, I think that would have to address the issue of Westminster parliamentary sovereignty. Unless you unpack that, unless you address Westminster parliamentary sovereignty, it's probably not going to be a radical set of solutions and it's not going to be federal either. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Mick next. Um, can you tell us, so you're part of this collective called Radical Federalism, and you released this paper at the start of the year called um, We the People, the Case for Radical Federalism. 
So can you tell us a bit about why you're part of this collective, what's happening in Wales and what you think radical federalism looks like in practice? OK, well, the starting point is exactly as been mentioned originally, uh, and that is the issue of sovereignty. Uh, when there was one parliament in Westminster for the whole of the UK, it was clear where sovereignty lay. The moment the four nations of the UK uh, uh, had parliaments with primary legislative powers, I think sovereignty has dramatically changed. Because if we accept that sovereignty effectively lies ultimately with the people, then the moment you have that parliamentary system that changes, uh, then sovereignty is one that is shared. And this is part of the dilemma, because uh, certainly we have a centralising UK government that actually doesn't recognise that that sovereignty has changed. And I think that is where the dysfunction is. For me, what is radical federalism? I think don't get hung up too much about the use of terms because they, the, the federalism, independence and so on, I mean different things to different people. For me, what radical federalism means is firstly, a UK which is based on a shared sovereignty, a voluntary uh, association of nations with common interest. It is based on the issue of subsidiarity. That is, we want decision making to be taken as close to people and communities as possible. But we do recognise that there is uh, those areas where there is common interdependence between nations. And those are the areas which really is where the, uh, uh, the, the need for common governance uh, actually exists. Also, the common raising of funds and resources in order for equality and redistribution of purpose. Uh, uh, and ultimately is based on a shared but a voluntary uh, sovereignty shared between the four nations. For me, those are what the underlying principles are. And for me, those are also the principles that it is absolutely fundamental that, uh, that UK Labour buys into now, because they are the starting point for reform. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, Anas, I'm obviously... The starting point for a lot of people when they're kind of asking you about this is Labour's difficulties in Scotland. It's one of the big challenges for the party and it's often thought that kind of Labour is in this very tricky situation, a bit like with Brexit, falling between two stools where it you know, can't be as pro-independence as a nationalist, it can't be as anti-independence as the Tories and being in the middle attracts these accusations at campaign time that you're not kind of a key player on the, key, on the main issue of the day. That certainly was brought up in the recent um, parliamentary elections. So does radical federalism appeal to you as a way of kind of resolving that problem? Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to UK and Changing Europe for the invitation to speak today. Um, I think it's important to set the context. Um, the context of it is we have deep divisions in the UK, uh, deep divisions within different nations of the UK, but also deep divisions within the wider UK. Uh, we've got clearly a, a government at a UK level, uh, and some would argue a government at a Scottish level that runs on the principle of an us versus them and, and furthering that division. Uh, I think we have deep entrenched inequality in the UK, it, that is pre-pandemic, but has been exacerbated by the pandemic. It, and I think you have a deep frustration with uh, the UK government uh, and Westminster that I think is more than just about Scotland or Wales versus the UK, but actually is a disconnect that people feel uh, in Birmingham, in Manchester and in Cardiff, just as much as they feel uh, in Manchester, uh, sorry, in uh, Glasgow or in Edinburgh. And so that's the context in which we're in. The part of that is what frustrates me is quite often when we have debates about devolution, they often are come in the form of trying to be a quick fix to an independence argument or looking like we're trying to find a powers fix uh, to what is a really difficult situation for both the Scottish Labour Party, but also, I think, for the UK Labour Party. And actually, when I was down campaigning in, in Batley and Spain recently, it felt like the UK Labour Party was where the Scottish Labour Party was five years ago. So we have to have urgent action. So let's push for further devolution, whether we call it radical federalism or not, let's push for further devolution, not as some kind of quick political fix, but because we mean it and we are truly the champions of devolution. What's happening with our mayors and also in Wales demonstrates the difference that you can make when you do push power out from Westminster into the nations and regions. And let's not view Scotland as some kind of monolith within that, where all the views are the same in all parts of Scotland. We actually need to push power out of Hollywood into local communities across the country as well. And Scottish Labour is really keen to engage in that debate, but also come up with a, a radical alternative 
that is the alternative to the us versus them politics, builds on all of us rather than us versus them, and gives that credible alternative both to the SNP and the Tories, something that I think uh, Mark Drakeford and the team in Wales have managed to do very, very successfully, uh, what our mayors have managed to do very, very successfully, and we've still got work to do, to be frank, in Scotland to give that alternative. Brilliant, thanks. Um, well, what you, you're mentioning mayors there, and obviously that's a perfect segue to Tracy. Um, so there's this strong line of thinking, I think, in the Labour Party at the moment, that mayors like you can, can really affect change, unlike being you know, a frustrated opposition MP, as so many MPs have been, and you experienced that. And you can change the party's image. And particularly during COVID, that really changed a lot of people's views, including Keir Starmer has said this about the whole mayoral model and, and what you can do and what you can do for the Labour Party as well and being community kind of champions. Do you think that's right? And also, kind of how has your experience so far being a mayor kind of changed your view of devolution within England? Would you like for it to be taken further and how? Um, thanks, Sienna, and certainly thank you to Labour List and UK and Changing Europe for inviting me here. Well, certainly what you're um, uh, articulating, the tension between being a, um, a, an MP in opposition, struggling to get changes in your community, and particularly when you don't have the 80 majority voting and not winning, and then becoming a mayor, there's a massive difference. And I think you mentioned uh, the pandemic, and actually we have seen Labour councils and councillors actually leading the way locally, whether that's um, identifying laptops for kids that have no digital equipment, or um, food for um, kids who are on free school meals or you know running their own testing tracking and tracing or you know uh, the vaccination program that's already been underway and mayors are just building I think on that local problem solving and certainly it's always great to be on these um, events listening to people like Nicola and Macon and us obviously so experienced in the role um, and learning so much myself having been the mayor of West Yorkshire for the um, 100 plus days. I obviously really am very excited about devolution. I know it's going to be fundamental for our party's future as we rebuild trust. And um, certainly Anna's mentioning that disconnect. It's absolutely true that when I talk about strangers in Whitehall and Westminster making decisions about people in West Yorkshire's lives, not knowing or understanding them, actually that could be said too for some colleagues in the Labour Party. It's really important that we are the ones that are leading the way on devolution and you mentioned Gordon Brown um, and the Keir Starmer's Commission on UK's future and he's invited me to sit on the board and he's so right when he says it's going to be impossible for our nations and regions with all their complexity and their diversity to hold together within the current system with that overly centralised system. Obviously others can speak on Scotland and Wales but I absolutely get, get it that in the north trust in politics and politicians is absolutely at an all-time low um, and you know they feel those de decision makers seem further and further away from our lives and people vote for something and they don't get it and then there's no there's no comeback or they get something else that they don't want and for example you know the leveling up empty words the the um the promises around transport it's just not good enough um yesterday I was speaking at the launch of Channel 4's new headquarters, the amazing, majestic, um, that used to be a nightclub that they're now uh, inhabiting. An absolutely brilliant moment for us. We bid for it because of Channel 4's diversity and their remit. And yet we have a, a Westminster government who have, um, in a few days, they'll close their consultation on privatising it. But that's not what we bid for. That's not what we bought. This is like a hostile takeover bid of a company that is in our family. So, you know, we could risk losing Channel 4's presence in Yorkshire and their commitment to the nations and regions commissioning of 50% that has had a massive impact across not just Leeds and Yorkshire, but Manchester and Liverpool, Newcastle. Uh, that, no, that commissioning outside London is so important. And as I mentioned about transport, six and, and uh, excuse me, announcements 
on travel and, and rail and so on, and not a shovel in the ground. So all these promises, this is why the people of the North are so dis, you know, disaffected, I think, with politicians. So when you look around at Labour in power, the Labour mayors and the devolved government in Wales, it's quite an exciting option, I think. People of their communities, speaking for the communities, living the same lives and promising to fix the problems and then going ahead and doing it. And certainly having run on my 10 manifesto pledges, whether that's introducing a fair work charter or put, bringing buses back under public control in the first 100 days, being able to say to the public, you voted for me. And every single one of my manifesto pledges has had money attached to it and we've moved the pledge on, and we have a plan that in three years, these pledges will be fulfilled. So I think it's that honesty and that clarity and simplicity of policies that we can definitely deliver with an authentic voice of someone that's grown up in this community and can deliver for the community that they care about. I think that's where the power is, that sort of compassion, empathy, and understanding of your community. Fantastic, thank you. So we've get, we're getting some questions through um, Slido at the moment. So everyone, you know, if you can think of anything that you'd like one of the panelists to answer, you can direct it towards them or towards the whole panel and just put it into Slido and I will try my best to read it out. So one of the questions that's come up a couple of times already um, is this question of an English parliament. So um, I'm gonna ask Nicola about this. Um, so John Denham, uh, the, who we know is very interested in this subject, says England has no machinery of government, ministerial or civil service. How can the governance of England be better delineated from the governance of the union? Nicola, would you like to address that one? I'll try, although John would probably be better at addressing it than me. Um, I mean, I think England is the elephant in the room, if you don't mind me describe it in that way, in a sense, because it is the most difficult bit to address if you want to have a constitutional arrangement that that looks coherent in terms of its size in terms of its constitutional status in terms of its economic might England is just so much bigger than all of the others which makes it really difficult to to have to design a system that is a sort of one size fits all so I think um there's nothing particularly wrong with something that is asymmetrical. I don't think you have to have a system that has the same arrangements for each part of the UK. And um, there's not a whole lot of evidence um, to suggest to me that there is a strong demand for an English parliament. But if there was, and that was to be designed, because of the size of England, it does mean that it becomes quite difficult to see what is left at the centre. It does, it's not impossible. Um, and there are different ways that you could design that, but fitting an English parliament alongside a UK parliament is the challenge. Now, there are other ways that you could do that through um, having a dedicated department for England within the UK government, for having some voices either from um, local authorities or, or, or locally elected mayors um, representing England um, within um, forums with the UK government directly or intergovernmental forums with the devolved institutions as well. There are plenty of things that can be done. Interesting that the only device that was tried so far in terms of English votes for English laws is no longer with us. Um, so I think the, the, the issue of how England is governed is absolutely central to the issue of how the UK is governed, but it doesn't have an easy answer, I'm afraid. Tracy, <laughs> no easy answer, but as a Metro Mayor within England, what's your take on this, on, on an English parliament, on regional parliaments within England? What do you think? I mean, no disrespect to John, but honestly, this is not what the people of Yorkshire are, are, are want, wanting from me. What they want is to know, for example, that I am happy and I'm working with 
uh, the other the other mayors. So, for example, working with Dan Jarvis, South Yorkshire, West Yorkshire on a cultural offer and an innovation corridor, working with Andy Burnham and Steve Rotherham on the Fair Work Charter. And we were all campaigning um, to keep Channel 4 in the, in the region with its remit. This is, is what, what connects people and our voters. And I know it is important for academics and I know it's important for politicians to, to really understand this stuff and to campaign on it. But this is not gonna be a priority for me at, at this moment. I would, I'd be happy to talk about what other powers mayors could potentially be campaigning for. And, and that is, I think, not even a Labour um, ask because I know that Andy Street um, has also been saying something along the same lines as, as me about climate change. How do we tackle climate change if we're doing it in silos? Uh, saying to government, give us the power and the money and resources to be able to make those changes locally to help you with your commitment to zero carbon um, in the next few decades, because the 2020s are when we should be actioning this. Um, and whilst, of course, you know, it's really important um, for, for some to identify where the power base is and so on, I, I really know the power base for me is here for the 2.3 million people that I represent working with other mayors. And let's not forget that the Northern mayors are representing 8 million people uh, collectively. Three in five people in the North have a mayor that represents them. So this is something that they're buying into. They're, they're excited about having a voice that stands up for them um, uh, with, you know, when challenging government and getting more resources. So for me, the priority is absolutely being the mayoral voice. Um, obviously, Anas and uh, Mick and others will have their thoughts about um, Scotland, Wales and England um, having parliaments and so on. But for me, my um, ask is to consolidate with the mayors and to be a strong power base here. OK, that's quite an, a clear answer. Mick, someone has actually directed a very similar question to you. Simon Shelley asked, Mick, do the four countries of the UK all have their own sovereign parliament or just three? Would an English parliament complement or destroy Westminster? Is this something that you've thought about with the, the collective radical federalism? Listen, I think we've thought about um, all these uh, particular variations and issues. And I think the starting point is this. Uh, what is happening now is not a process that has just emerged in the last couple of years. I mean, I wrote about 15 years ago uh, that if we didn't actually sort out the constitutional dysfunction, the UK would risk breaking up. Giving evidence to the uh, to Parliament uh, a few months ago, the First Minister of Wales said that never before in his lifetime had the UK been on the precipice of uh, so close to break up as it is now. And uh, I'm a little bit more pessimistic in, in this, or a bit, bit, bit less gung ho than uh, I, I think some of the some of the last comments because. I actually think we have across the UK a, a, a crisis in our democracy, you know, when 40% of people don't vote in general elections, 50% uh, don't vote in Welsh uh, parliamentary elections, uh, and 60% don't vote in council elections. I think when you have that level of disengagement, there is firstly a crisis of the democracy and disengagement. I think what you do have that has been developing over the, over several decades, and maybe it's within, the, you know, as, as the world has become increasingly globally capitalist and centralist and corporatist etc that the issue of class identity and community have really sort of emerged in a way which I don't think they uh, did before I think they were always there but they're much stronger so you look around in terms of the the, the identity of Welsh Labour and the best election results we would had look at Andy Burnham in Manchester that identity there getting what 63 64 uh, percent of the vote so uh, I, I think there is a, a change there is an undercurrent in politics of people wanting to feel that they have control wanting to have control over the decisions that affect them. I think a lot of that and inequality was what was behind 
Brexit. You know, Brexit was one of the biggest constitutional uh, challenges, but those challenges haven't actually got away. Taking on the, the point that was made earlier in terms of uh, Westminster and the parliaments of the UK, I think the biggest question really in terms of the hegemony of the UK, whether the, there is a purpose to and the survival of the UK, actually comes to about redefining what the role of Westminster is. Because quite often when Boris Johnson speaks, for example, on COVID, he's not speaking as a prime minister for the UK. He's actually speaking as a uh, prime minister for, for England. Often even when uh, some of our Labour shadow ministers speak, for example, on education, they're speaking as shadow ministers for England. So I think that there has to be a recognition of those changes, those undercurrents that are there. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, there are ways forward. I mean, we are setting up our own constitutional commission within Wales. It will be launched within probably uh, the next six weeks or so. But I do think one of the key issues that has to be resolved is the uh, decentralisation of power and the delineation of that power. And I think it does actually mean that we need to start looking seriously uh, at a Bill of Rights. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll, we will come back to that. Um, I I know that um, what you were saying about shadow ministers only speaking for, for England, but not kind of saying that explicitly, I know is something that people are interested in. I know that obviously we, we've run a, a few pieces from John Denham actually about that very thing and how Labour should be, you know, saying England uh, explicitly when it's talking about England. Um, Nas, I know that um, Nicola has talked about this before. She's... I, I saw her, <laughs> I watched an event um, that she did recently, another UK and Changing Europe event, where she was talking about how radical federalism is possibly not appealing to Nats because a federal restructuring probably won't enhance the authority of Scotland given its relative size of population. What, what do you think about that, that kind of possible criticism from a Scot Scottish perspective of federalism and a federal UK? Th th thanks, yeah. Um, I think it's an interesting question, and I, I actually think it needs to be split into two different parts. It, the first thing I should say as a point of principle is, ultimately, it's for England to decide how England uh, is governed. It's not really, it's not for me um, as a member of the Scottish Parliament or indeed Mick uh, as an AM to uh, to decide how Scotland, cho sorry, England chooses to structure itself. Uh, but when I think about the answer, I think about it in two parts. One is a powers and structures part. And there's a second one, and I think Mick alluded to this, is an emotional part. And I think we quite often, um, as pro-devolutionists and also as a Labour Party, think about powers and structures and think less about emotion. And I'll come to emotion in just a second. Purely on the structure and the powers part. Um, I, look, as for, as it's for England to decide, I think the challenge that England has is it is such a huge part of the wider UK. Um, it is not a monolith itself, as is demonstrated by... Uh, Tracy and, and the other mayors uh, and there'll be different priorities and different needs and different aspirations in different parts uh, of England just like I would argue there's different priorities different aspirations different needs in different parts of Scotland and one of the challenges I think we've had in Scotland is uh, by having a Scottish Parliament which I support which I want to enhance and which I want to give more powers is we have in some ways sucked up power in Holyrood rather than pushed power out of Holyrood into local authorities and different regions within Scotland which I think is in itself um, is a mistake. So a lot of that is what would have been regional or city identity, I think has been lost in recent years uh, in Scotland as a result of that push of power uh, within um, Scotland itself. So how we push power out, I think is really important. The second part I make about emotion, and actually I think this is probably a bigger challenge um, for colleagues in England than actually the constitutional setup in terms of the English parliament, as I fully support pushing power down and out in terms of more uh, regional mayors is what, what, what is Englishness and defining Englishness? Because I think a lot of what has happened over recent years is we have allowed people, either in Scotland or in Wales, particularly Welsh or Scottish nationalists, to define Englishness in the form that they wish to define it. And I think quite often we've allowed uh, the Tories uh, and the far right to define Englishness in the way that they would like to define it. When in actual fact, a progressive, outward looking, unified, all of us rather than us versus them form of Englishness, actually as captured by, I think, Gareth Southgate and the England football team in the European Championships, is actually a really, really good model that I would really urge colleagues in England to, to adopt and live and breathe in terms of what it means in practice. Don't allow those that want to divide us to define what Englishness is. 
Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to have a look at some of the other um, questions on Slido. I think there's quite a lot of technical ones that I want to aim at Nicola, but I don't want her to just be bombarded with lots of different technical questions about um, uh, devolution and, and federalism. So, well, we don't have a Northern Ireland representative on this panel. We can't do everything in every event. But someone has asked, Cliff has asked, does your approach to federalism include Northern Ireland? It seems like there's an opportunity for Labour to organise Northern Ireland, given the implosion of the DUP, etc. Um, Mick, would you like to just address that one? If, it, if it's something that you have thought about. Um, it is, and it's one of the most difficult areas because of the particular circumstances within Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is a part of the UK until the people of Northern Ireland, by majority, decide uh, otherwise. And within a federal structure, there clearly would need to be that arrangement. And we've seen what the consequences are, really, from uh, leaving the EU of the uh, uh, of the dilemma of the of the dilemma there. So I, I, I think I think it has to be. Uh, I don't know whether it nationally means that the Labour Party has to organise or whether it's the SDLP or what the arrangements there are. But it seems to me, I mean, and us made a very important point early on, you know, it's not for Wales and Scotland to determine the arrangements in England. And I think equally so in terms of determining position within Northern Ireland, that has to come with the consensus of the people of Northern Ireland about what they want their relationship to be, either with the UK or, or indeed otherwise. Uh, and of course, there, there's provision for that. And of course, that is one of the undercurrents, I think, within the current political environment that we're in here's a quick um sort of technical question for nicola um hugh asks what is the difference between federalism and confederalism um very good question in a sense um to some extent what the consul general was talking about earlier is a little bit more like a confederation where you have sovereign entities that are coming together um, to agree a shared governing arrangement uh, rather than a, a, a unit, rather than a country um, designing as itself as a whole country, a system where they agree to share power um, in particular ways, a variety of different models that you can have as federalism. But the boundaries between the two uh, can be uh, quite blurry. Could I pick up a little bit on some of the things that were said earlier? Because um, I wanted to, to respond a little bit to to what Tracy was saying about um, the, the difference between the local governance, the kind of thing that you are embracing, um, and the calls for an English parliament. I, I don't think these are either ors. If you had an English parliament, which has lots of different issues, but if that was what the people of England decided that they wanted, um, and you didn't have that local governance element, alongside it, then England would still be one of the most centralised countries in Europe. And um, so I don't think it's, it's either either or. And just on the, the, the points that you attributed to me um, around federalism and uh, whether it, that would suit um, and perhaps help to resolve uh, the, the constitutional debates within Scotland, I think one of the important things that we need to acknowledge in this debate is that the UK is a multinational state. There are, there is a recognition among um, the, the different parts of the UK that there are different national communities within it. It may well be also the case that there is something called the British national community. Um, so the, these things again are not either ours, but the issue with something like um, a, a house of, Lords being replaced by a Senate of Nations and Regions is that that kind of reform in and of itself is not going to enhance the voice of the nations of Scotland and Wales and the territory of Northern Ireland, uh, because assuming that was a democratic forum, then those voices would probably be as dwarfed in that context as they are uh, within the House of Commons. Thank you. Okay, so we have we have so many questions. Um, I'm going to go to one um, about this is for this is for Anas. So this is quite a sort of general question. I think that you've already sort of covered it, but maybe you could go a bit a bit into some more detail. So someone says, how can Scottish Labour put forward the argument for radical federalism as a compromise in the binary, yet simple to understand? Um, union versus independence debate. How do you 
obviously we've just had an election in Scotland, but how do you plan to do that over the coming years in the, in the run up to the next election and make sure that, you know, the media doesn't attack Scottish Labour for kind of being sitting on the fence, that kind of thing? Thanks. I think the first thing to say is that we can't present it as a compromise. It, it can't be a compromise. If, if we present it as a compromise, then uh, I, I think it, it won't feel like we were truly arguing with something because we truly believed it or we thought it was going to make a meaningful difference. If we are going to be the party of devolution, then we've got to own the principle of devolution and make the argument for devolution and be unashamed about making the argument for devolution. The status quo um, is not furthering devolution and um, independence is not the end point uh, in terms of the destination of devolution, although it does end uh, devolution. And I think the big challenge we've had as, as a Labour Party in Scotland, I'm quite um, open and, and honest about it, is we talked a lot about building an alternative to the SNP and the Tories. I've, I've, I must say it on a daily basis since uh, both during and, and after the election campaign, but if we're honest about it, we haven't given the people of Scotland the Labour Party they deserve in recent years. Um, and a big part of why we face the struggle we have is I think there is deep frustration with some of the performances of government, um, but there hasn't been a credible alternative uh, given to them. Um, I think we have allowed it to become a binary choice in Scotland between unionism and nationalism, where people shout loudly about unionism from the Tories and push people that way, and people shout about nationalism and they push uh, people that way and, and force people into a binary choice, when actually I think that's a false choice to be made. I would actually argue uh, that there is a middle ground that we can uh, focus on in Scotland. Uh, muscular unionism is not going to work. Uh, simply just shouting no, and uh, simply saying that in all circumstances, the SNP are always wrong, the Tories are always right, or the UK is always right, isn't going to work. Uh, muscular unionism will fail. Uh, just like I think blindfolded nationalism will fail. If we say to people that um, independence will be whatever you want it to be, whatever your worries, whatever your priorities, everything will be fine after we vote for independence, I think that is ultimately going to fail as well. And I actually think a big part of the problem is that the biggest threat to the United Kingdom is actually the Tories rather than the SNP in that that feeling of disconnect that people feel, we've, we've heard it from Tracy around Yorkshire, we heard it from Mick uh, around Wales, is that level of disconnect does push people away and we haven't offered people a credible alternative yeah, and that's what we've got to do over the coming years is build that credible alternative. That means strong leadership, it means a, a credible alternative in terms of um, poverty policy, in terms of devolution policy but it also crucially means a credible alternative on social and economic policy eh, as well. Eh, and I'm really, really focused and determined that we do that. The final part I'd say eh, on terms of Scotland is Scotland's a small place. Nicola will know this. Um, Scotland's a small place. Everyone knows everyone. And if they don't, they know someone, they know someone. Eh, therefore, relationships matter in Scotland. Networks matter in Scotland. And genuine engagement and relationship building across different parts of Scotland matter. Uh, and we've simply not been good enough at it. The SNP were much better at it uh, pre the election in 2007. I, I think they've, they're losing that and there is a sense of them being out of touch uh, or feeling as if they're untouchable um, in parts of Scotland. We've got to take advantage of that and actually get out there in communities again and actually build from the bottom up, not this top down recovery uh, that people seem to think is, is easy enough. It's a hard, long, hard slog, but I'm absolutely determined that we do it. Fantastic. Um... Tracy, I'm going to go to you next. There's a couple of questions. You might want to reflect on some of the stuff that Ness was saying, but also a couple of questions about England. Um, George Peretz says, not exactly a constitutional proposal, but would making the UK capital um, the, in the north of England be the most effective and eye-catching way of rebalancing power in the UK? What do you think about that idea? And someone else, Margaret Fall Follen, says, there are many positive and dynamic things happening in areas run by Labour administrations in various settings across the country. Why don't we hear about them? What do you think about those two questions and, and perhaps what Anas was saying as well? Yeah, thanks. I'm loving the idea of the capital moving to Yorkshire. Um, uh, it, is, it has been interesting that we've got the Bank of England, the UK Infrastructure Bank, some um, uh, treasuries, uh, some departments coming to the north, but it has to be um, significant and it cannot be just a satellite where people commute three days a week um, in order to say that they're actually um, you know, doing their bit for the North. Um, just to pick up a couple of things that Mick was saying and Anas about 
emotional connection. And I think I am obviously much more optimistic than Mick because I do think in the mayoral elections, and it was the first ever uh, mayoral election we'd had, and lots of people don't even know what a mayor is, um, so and they've nothing to compare it to. But winning 60% of the vote and doing even better than the, in the council elections, um, uh, uh, sort of the equivalents doing better than councillors. I do think there seemed to be a bit of excitement around the, the mayorality. And I think after three years, when you can see what a mayor can deliver, I think we can build on that. So I think we can get to a point where if you're from Yorkshire, you vote Labour. Of course you do. Why would you vote any, any other way? And that if we think that in, in West Yorkshire, we've got an output of... 55.4 billion pounds, bigger than nine European countries, 2.3 million people, as I said, 90,000 businesses and 1.1 million people workforce. This is a massive um, uh, group of people that potentially are going to be, you know, investing in labour and believing that labour can deliver and actually feeling in their heart that, you know, led by a, a Yorkshire woman, if you're from Yorkshire, you vote Labour. And I think that's really important that we tell that story, that it's it's about identity and belonging. And I think Labour, you know, can, can build on that. And just to pick up as well on the idea of, you know, that uh, uh, reconstruction about the about the, the the way that we look at Westminster. I know that Gordon Brown is talking about having a representation for the regional mayors in the House of Lords, what would that look like? And that actually is quite exciting, potentially simple, to have that voice as a second chamber um, and to be a filter for um, the House of Commons. You know, what would, what, that could be quite exciting as well. And Sienna, you'll have to remind me about the second question. The second question was basically, there are lots of positive things happening um, in areas run by Labour administrations and uh, Labour mayors as well. Why don't we hear enough about them? Well, um, I'm, I'm surprised you don't hear enough about them because this is what our mission is, to be an absolute voice for our region. And I think that collective um, experience, um, you know, there's an event, for example, at Labour Conference, Labour in Power, uh, that Anas is going to be speaking at, uh, Mark Drakeford, uh, myself and others. So, you know, to make that case that the mayor's standing together with Labour values, uh, with authentic regional voices, with trusted by their community, saying this is what Labour in Power looks like. We are, we are the vanguard uh, that will get you know labor into number 10 because we will be on the ground as a persuasive trusted voice to deliver now obviously in the disparity in the mayoral deals is quite frustrating so for example i'm also the police and crime commissioner which is incredibly helpful because for example um looking at everything like housing transport further education all the things that i have responsibilities for as mayor as a police and crime commissioner i can say i'm putting the safety of women and girls at the heart of everything i do and then we can have a public health approach to that. So I can look at housing, I can look at transport and the safety of transport, the nighttime economy, et cetera. I have that great opportunity now, not all mayors have that. I don't have health uh, as a responsibility, Andy Burnham does. So he can you know, speak very eloquently on social care because he's in a position to make a difference there. So I think, there's also a, a job of work to be done about what is the absolute minimum we want for our mayors? What is the minimum devolution package that we can persuade government to agree to? I'm worried that they, they're gonna see that what we're achieving as Labour mayors and they're gonna go completely stone cold on devolution and pull back, which is very um, frustrating. So, you know, we have an opportunity to sing and dance about it. And um, I have met people, you know, constituents, people who didn't vote for me and people who did vote for me to say, saying, you know, finally, we've got someone who speaks for us, who's, who's one of us. 
um, you know, who, who lives like us, particularly as a commute on the bus. People love a chat on the bus. And, you know, they say, you know, you, it's great to see someone who is now a voice for our region. And I think that's what regions need is that par powerful voice. And that's where Anas really does, um, you know, do a great job speaking for Labour in Scotland. Um, and hopefully we do that for our regions as well. So it's something I, I hope that over the next few months that um, people on this call will hear more about the, the mayors going forward. What, what would you say, Tracy, would be your kind of, what would you advocate for being the, the minimum package of powers yeah. that the mayor should have? I know Dan Jarvis, for instance, he's still an MP because he has many fewer powers than, than people like you. Do, would you say that being a PCC, having having health under your brief all of those things should be the minimum well for me um, my priority actually is climate change so i think we there is further to go there so that we can actually own our carbon reduction we can decide exactly how many ev charging points we want we want more we can buy the buses rather than having to go to government and say please sir come have some money for electric buses um and we can we can make that massive investment that is needed because uh, for example in the devolution deal i get money for hard flood defenses the capital funding but i don't get the revenue funding to maintain them so that's a disconnect. Um, I also think as the shadow minister for early years, for a, a couple of years, uh, when Angela Rayner was the shadow education minister, uh, early intervention is really important in my PCC role, but I don't have any um, education powers so i'm having to do all my early intervention uh, stuff whether that sure starts or whether you know working with councils to support them and their offering around early intervention and and um family hubs etc i i don't have formal powers of course i've got my soft powers convening powers um leading from the front having that voice bringing in inward investment but um i think climate change is a priority that, that all the mayors could do with greater powers um in, in that region Thank you. Um, Mick, I'm going to go to you next. So I wondered whether you, you'd you probably have things to reflect on everything that has just been said, but also um, someone has asked uh, about something that I think has come up quite a bit in Welsh Labour. Um, I know that at the last conference, the real, real in-person conference, um, I had a discussion with Mark Drakeford about uh, this question. So they said, assuming radical federalism is desirable, to what extent should this be reflected in your internal party governance? We hear a lot on Labour internal structure. So would you like to reflect on some of those things, including kind of in internal Labour Party structures? Well, what what I would say is is that firstly, the the identity, the branding of Welsh Labour and what it means and the way it is attuned within Wales, I think has been really been significant because it's been done one on the base of being able to have competent government and COVID has shown that, but also in, in all sorts of things like the, the fact we've taken our transport back into public ownership. You know, we, we have a social partnership where businesses, trade unions uh, and government collaborate in terms of social policy, in terms of economic policy and so on. So people, people have seen that and they've seen that attunement. In, in terms of the uh, relationship and the, uh, the identity of Welsh Labour, uh, I, I think that the problem, there is, a, there is an issue with the UK Labour party as a whole in terms of it is still very much based i think on a sort of post second world war fairly centralistic and fairly london centric uh, structure uh, and i think that is something that does need to be explored and to represent greater i mean the fact that you know the mayors are not represented on the national executive committee uh, in that directly despite the fact that they are forms of local government what i do think is is that uh, the welsh the labor party structure and probably uh, even regionally as well should not be uh, less than what we are arguing should be the constitutional structure of the UK. So we're arguing for more de decentralised UK. Uh, we're arguing for more federalised UK structure. And I think the, the structure of the party has to equally uh, reflect those changes. And I think, for example, for within Wales, uh, I think that means even uh, uh, looking at a federalised uh, Labour Party structure as well. OK, so Anas, I've got a couple of questions for you. I wanted to ask you the same sort of thing. I, I remember during the, the leadership election, I think I asked you about you know, that famous quote about the, the branch office. This is obviously something that comes up a lot in Scottish Labour uh, as well. So the same kind of questions about internal party structures 
But also, um, it's already been mentioned, Joe has asked, what are your thoughts on uh, Gordon Brown's suggestion of a Senate of Nations and Regions? If you'd like to comment on both of those. Thanks, Sarah. Can, can, I, can I amplify what, what Mick said in response to uh, the question? Um, st structure uh, and, uh, is really, really important. Getting the right structure is really important. But actually, the culture also needs to change um, as well, and the mindset needs to change. Um, and I think quite often what happens is the mindset holds us back, even when we get the structures right, um, and then there, there, there becomes this really strange debate where... Um, depending on the alignment of what side people think the leader in Scotland's on and the leader in the UK party's on, people either want uh, more involvement and oversight from the UK or they want less oversight and involvement from the UK. I think it needs to go beyond personalities, it needs to go beyond what side people think anyone is on. Uh, we have to have uh, a devolved structure. I'm not shy about saying in Scotland, I'm the boss. I just say what's happened in Scotland, uh, not people in the UK Labour Party, and that has to be the mindset uh, that we have and it has to be the culture that we adopt um, as well. The other thing I'd say is, uh, just on culture, is look, we, we have a culture issue around uh, the, how we think about devolution. Um, we have a culture issue around um, our, our um, factionalism. Let's be, let's be blunt about it. And I think we also have another culture issue, which is around defeatism. So I've said a bit about the structures and devolution. Let me just say a bit about factionalism. Um, and... Um, I've made this point directly to, to Keir, I've made it directly to Angela Rayner, I've made it directly to the UK Shadow Cabinet, I've made it directly to uh, the UK PLP. Uh, I see it regularly in open forums uh, here in Scotland, uh, and I'm just happy to say it here, and I, I apologise by using expletive um, in, in the process. See if there's any factional bullshit, keep it out of Scotland. We don't, we, we've got enough problems of our own uh, in terms of trying to rebuild the Scottish Labour Party without the internal fights that people might want to have elsewhere. So if you want to do factionalism, do it somewhere else, not Scotland. And if you want to do factionalism elsewhere, keep the constitution out of it, because the only people that helps is our opposition, whether that's the opposition in terms of the Tories at Westminster or the SNP and the Tories uh, here in Scotland. Uh, no, no thank you uh, to factionalism. Uh, and the final point I'll make is about the culture of defeatism. Um, one of the big challenges that we have in Scotland is this idea of it's all inevitable. We're gonna, it's all inevitable to fail. We're going to continue to lose. It's about managing decline. I have no interest in it. I am not in this job, and neither is Keir in his job, and neither is Tracy in her job, eh, or Mick in his, to manage the decline of the Labour Party. We're here to regrow and rebuild the Labour Party so we can actually do important, meaningful things in government. So we have to end the culture of defeatism and recognise in our collective interest eh, to rebuild the party. We all love it so we can confront the big challenges of our time. Um, so uh, the point I'm making on a devolution context on that is, yes, devolution is important to that, but it's not everything. There is not a powers fix to the problems facing our country. Yes, the structures and the powers can help us deliver our objectives, and that's why we should support them, we should advocate them, we should champion them. But actually, we have to have a radical policy platform, a deliverable policy platform, and also win on the argument of emotion if we are going to beat the SNP and the Tories and have a Labour government, uh, both in Scotland and across the UK. And the final point I'll make is, we ain't ever going to have a Labour government across the UK unless we solve the problems in Scotland. So I've heard a lot about the Red Wall in the north of England. The first Red Wall to fall was Scotland. And unless we rebuild that Red Wall in Scotland, we ain't getting a UK Labour government. Thank you. Oh, did you also want to comment on the, the, the proposal, the Gordon Brown proposal? Oh, well, sorry, my, my apologies. I completely forgot that second question. Look, I, I'm, I'm in favour of a, of a Senate of the Nations and Regions. I, I completely accept the point. Um, that Nicola makes around um, the imbalance. That imbalance is more a population-based imbalance, um, which, which will naturally mean that you'd have the argument that they should be proportional based on um, population size in terms of what the nations and regions should be. Um, I think that is probably still a massive amount of progress from what I imagine the makeup of the current House of Lords is, which I imagine is probably not anywhere near population representation uh, and is very London-focused and very London-centric. So I do support a Senate of the Nations and Regions. I do support it being an elected chamber rather than it being an appointed chamber and it being a revising chamber and an oversight chamber the way it, sh it should be. Is it the perfect solution? Is it the perfect fix? Of course it's not, but it's one part of what I think has to be a package of measures going forward. Great. So Nicola, I'm sure you've got loads of thoughts on what has already been said. I'll also throw a couple of extra questions at you. 
Um, someone has asked, um, it is argued that true federalism, parliamentary sovereignty would have to go for it. Uh, as a bedrock of the UK constitution, surely this would require a referendum. So would it? And the other question um, is sort of related. Parliament, Stanley says, Parliament cannot bind itself. Do we need a written constitution, which includes protection for devolved powers from simply being changed by a later parliament? So I know that Keir Starmer has talked in the past about a written constitution during the leadership election, but I don't think he's talked about it since. I don't know whether it's something that the Constitutional Commission is covering. Maybe Tracy could tell us about that. But yeah, Nicola, what are your thoughts? Okay, um, a few things, and just on the, the point about a Senate of the Nations and Regions, I, I think it's almost certainly a, a, a positive policy idea in and of itself. It's just if it was presented as in some way, the way that you um, bring people away from the idea of independence, then it's not going to be effective in that sense, but in and of itself, um, as in a, a democratic reform, a modernization reform, the, UK constitution then you know there's there's lots of positive things can be said about it um i was really interested in in anis's point about um culture and mindset not just structures which i think anas you were um referring to the internal organization of the labor party but you could also make the same points about any constitutional structures as well and i think one of the things that we're seeing at the moment is that even when you have devolved structures, you don't necessarily have the culture and the mindset that embraces that as a positive attribute of the way that the UK is governed. Somebody was mentioning earlier um, about um, how it's not always clear when UK government ministers are talking for the UK or talking for England. Um, and I think perhaps a few years ago, we might have forgiven them for just not being very aware of that. I think they probably are very aware of it now and just don't particularly want to acknowledge um, that sometimes the UK government only speaks for England. And that's a cultural issue. That's a mindset issue um, that I, th I think uh, needs to be addressed as well. On the point about managing um, decline, um, the Welsh Labour Party hasn't managed decline. The Welsh Labour Party has managed success. And it's always struck me as it's quite strange in a sense that the Labour Party in Scotland has not looked more to Welsh Labour to see how to make a success of devolution, how to position yourself. And of course, it's a completely different context. Of course, the party system is very different. The challenges are very different. But the Labour Party in Wales, it seems to me, has been comfortable in occupying the space of um, unashamedly defending Welsh interests, Welsh distinctiveness. In academic circles, we would talk, you won't like this term, but we would say it was small n, nationalist, and reasonably comfortable doing so in a way that has been more difficult for, for Labour in Scotland. But I think there's a massive opportunity now uh, for, for Anas to, to change things and to, to change Labour's fortunes in the North. Final thing for me, just on parliamentary sovereignty, um, the, the Parliament not binding itself is, of course, the essence of parliamentary sovereignty. Um, and I think you would, um, if you were to address that, I don't think it particularly needs a referendum. A constitution might require a referendum to have consent. But if you were to ask people about parliamentary sovereignty, I'm not sure there'd be a whole lot of um, understanding of what we were actually talking about. But I think if you were to change that, you would be looking at a codified constitution um, so that um, and, and that is that would be indeed a radical reform uh, for the United Kingdom. There's no getting away from that. Um, but it would be about, um, could be about many things, but one of the things it could be about is entrenching the powers that each of the legislatures and each of the parliaments in the different parts of the UK have. Mick, I, I reckon you have some really interesting thoughts on what Nicola was saying there about the Welsh Labour Party. And often it is, it is said, um, that, that not enough attention is paid to the fact that Labour is literally winning in Wales <laughs> and that we don't talk about that enough um, in, in Westminster circles anyway. So what were, you, what were your kind of reflections on what Nicola was saying there? And also, 
I'm just going to ask everyone just to, to sum up next for one or two minutes. So Mick, if you'd like to answer that and also sum up and then I'll go to each of you. Listen, the first thing is I, I absolutely agree. And it is not just Labour politicians. It is Plaid Cymru politicians, Conservative politicians who are saying that effectively in Wales, the only national party in Wales or that can call itself a national party uh, is uh, Welsh Labour. What is very clear is that the, the, the Welsh Labour, I mean, we have this talk about, you know, well, we've moved slightly onto the nationalist territory. Well, we used to say, well, you know, the nationalists have moved slightly onto the socialist territory and so on. I think, I think what it boils down to is that when it has come to important and crucial decisions, the Welsh Labour Party has always stood up for Wales and identified, managed to identify what those Welsh interests are, but stood up for them. At one stage, we had the, you know, the clear red water, uh, which in fact was a construct from the current first minister. And it hasn't been done in a sort of negative or a, a destructive way, but it has been a way in which people have identified that there you have someone that they've elected, uh, a party that is actually standing up for their interests, and often in quite a radical way, and also even, for example, within the Labour Party, so that when there are issues on Europe and so on, the Welsh position was absolutely clear in terms of what we were saying would be our position, etc. Now, whether people agree or disagree with it, the fact of the matter is, it's the identity with the fact that you know, as socialists, we are standing up for the communities and the people of Wales, and that identity is now there. And I think that is the core part uh, of uh, why, why Welsh Labour has been successful. Look, in terms of just uh, the, the, the summing up position, overall, I think that change is, is happening. We have to embrace change, not seeing it as something that's negative, but something that's positive. You know, in a socialist, th this change is something that we can really you know, move to our advantage. The empowerment of people and communities. You know, was Nye Bevan said, you know, the purpose to winning power is to give it away. That is to empower people. And I, I think that almost should be our, our core calling card of, uh, of what we're about when we start talking about reform. It's about improving the lives, the ability to deliver improvements for the lives of people uh, in the society, the people that uh, we represent. Thank you so much. Tracy, would you like to sum up your thoughts next? Yeah, absolutely. And can I just say we are not managing decline in Yorkshire. We're absolutely smashing it. And um, uh, certainly there's a lot of optimism um, in the region about what we can do and what we can achieve. And certainly to empower the people is my is in the DNA of devolution, isn't it? And what I'm able to do is to better use devolution as a vehicle for equality um, and diversity and inclusivity. You know, being able to um, uh, to recruit an inclusivity champion to power through the, that inclusive growth that we all want uh, 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 as Labour politicians across our region. And to be able to do that and to be able to say that we need more women, we need, we need more black and uh, diverse politicians and leaders and councillors and community leaders but uh, you know being in a position to be able to make that happen and make it a priority for a combined authority of nearly 700 members of staff in the first instance and then more widely this is a way that we empower people we drop the ladder of empowerment so that people can make decisions about their lives and that we can improve lives on the ground and be a champion for labor values and, and the identity of labor across the regions. Um, you know, we can actually be that um, calling card for laboring in government. Obviously there is laboring government in Wales and I've stolen a lot of their great ideas for Yorkshire. So thank you very much for being trailblazers. Um, but, you know, working together, standing together as labor politicians, um, uh, you know, being able to decide. But the, the key for me when it comes to devolution is having an opportunity to make decisions for ourselves, being sustainable financially without having to go to government, bid into pots like a beauty contest against each other um, for small pots of money, doing all that work and then not being given the resources to deliver. It's really important that we get rid of that, that bidding process and we are given the money that we 
deserve and we need in order to deliver for the people we represent. But it is an exciting time for Labour in the regions. And I'm hugely proud uh, to be the mayor for West Yorkshire. And like I say, uh, uh, the first ever woman Metro mayor, we need more women um, in positions like myself to change the lives of others for the people they represent. Fantastic, thank you so much. And Anas? Thanks, Sienna. And, and can I, first of all, thank, thank you and you King Chain Europe again for organising the event. And thank Tracy and Mick for the, for the energy and positivity. I think you can quite clearly see uh, the difference that Labour makes when it's uh, in power uh, and the difference it can make to our communities and be an example, I think, a driving force, an example uh, to what we're trying to do in uh, Scotland, uh, but also what Keir is trying to do in the whole of the UK. Uh, and can I start by co completely agreeing with the, the points that both Nicola um, and Mick made about learning the lessons from Wales. Um, I actually think we've we've failed to learn the lessons of Wales um, over the last 10, 15 years, and I could probably do an entire session tonight uh, on why some of that is. Um, a big part of that, to be honest, is I think Welsh Labour has been confident enough in itself to challenge and differentiate from the UK party on principle on big issues. And I think there was probably a reluctance, I think, of Scottish Labour to do that, uh, partly because Scottish Labour felt perhaps it was at the heart uh, of a UK Labour government, so didn't want to rock uh, the boat. Um, and that, I think, probably posed its own challenges uh, and perhaps gave more open goals to uh, to the opposition. So I think that's a lesson we need to learn. Um, one part of that is a, is a devolution lesson. Um, so again, I emphasise the point I made right at the start. We cannot be advocating greater devolution or radical federalism or whatever we choose to call it as some kind of political fix uh, to the problems that we face in Scotland or some kind of political face, uh, fix to the problems we face in some parts of England in response to Brexit. It has to be who we are. It has to be in our DNA. And that's fundamentally because we believe in sharing power, wealth and opportunity across communities across the UK. Uh, and it has to be part of our driving purpose. Uh, I would layer on top of that to make sure, and, and again, agreeing with what Nicola said, uh, we have got to capture the emotion uh, of sharing power, not just the structures uh, of sharing power if we are to make a difference. And I think there is an opportunity for Labour to give a vision that works for people across all parts of the UK um, and a vision that works in terms of the rebirth of the Labour Party across the UK and in different parts within the UK. And that is to confront the politics of division, to confront the politics of us versus them, to confront the culture wars that the Tories, for example, want to pursue in some parts uh, of the UK and instead say there is a way where we have an all of us rather than an us versus them politics. That means pushing power, wealth and opportunity to the nations and regions of the UK, but it also means a radical, credible alternative, not just on the constitution, but on economic and social policy as well. That's partly around culture. We've spoken a bit about that. It's partly about structure. We've spoken about that too, but it's also about, I think, tone and language. Capturing the politics of empathy, again, I think is really important in the face of that divisive language that we see uh, from those that seek to pull us apart. Um, people have, I think, a, a, a despair around division being inevitable. I think we need to capture the spirit of unity across our country, the spirit that we saw during this pandemic, where actually our communities pulled together to pull us through this pandemic. We've got to capture that spirit of unity in the face of division. Uh, and in the face of despair, uh, I don't think the Labour Party wins by trying to make 50% or 51% of the population angry with 49% of the population, which has been the tactic of the UK Conservative Party. In the face of despair, in the face of division, in the face of hatred, we have to give a positive alternative rooted in hope and opportunity to the people across this UK if we are to win again in different parts of the UK and return a UK Labour government, as well as a Labour government, I hope, at some point in the near future in Scotland. And I look forward to engaging that debate with the colleagues in the call and the wider Labour family in the coming months and years. Thank you so much. Um, Nicola, I'm going to turn to you last. If you'd like to just reflect on, I mean, you're an expert on territorial politics, what, on what you've heard tonight from these top Labour representatives on radical federalism and, and devolution and what, what you think about their, their views. Yeah, I mean, first of all, just on behalf of the UK and the Change in Europe, thank you very much to everybody for, for joining us uh, for this discussion. It's been really, really interesting. Um, and I was reflecting on um, something as Anas was talking there 
something that one of your predecessors, Kezia Dugdale, has said quite a few times, which is, I didn't get into politics to talk about the Constitution. And that's a feeling that I've often heard from Labour politicians, particularly Scottish Labour, where it's been a kind of discomfort thinking about the constitutional issues as if that's a, a distraction from bread and butter issues or social and economic issues. Um, and I think part of the success that the SNP has had, and indeed probably Labour and Wales as well, has been to see these things um, in tandem, to see where constitutional empowerment, to use Tracy's word, um, can help with addressing some of the social and economic issues that are dear to this party's heart. And so it's really interesting to see that shift in, in tone there um, uh, from Anas, and I look forward to seeing what, what comes next. And of course, devolution doesn't have to be necessarily about the national parliaments. It can be also about um, devolution within Scotland, within Wales, within um, England, and I have some sympathy with the view that was expressed earlier about um, devolution, setting up institutions in, in, in Edinburgh in particular, perhaps in Cardiff too, having in some ways a centralising effect um, in, in these places too. Um, one thing I, I would say, and we haven't really had a chance to talk about it much, is that in thinking about devolution, um, or in thinking about federalism, it isn't just about the powers that are devolved or the powers that are decentralized, you have to also think about the powers that are shared. And that's been the real weakness, the real Achilles heel of UK devolution from the beginning. And again, hats off to the Welsh Labour government. That's something that you have recognized in repeated documents to try to make a plea for enhancing the shared governing arrangements. And we've seen some of the effects of not having that through the Brexit process. So it's something just to bear in mind as well. How do you share in the decision making over those UK issues that have a, an important impact and effect on the responsibilities and the powers of the devolved institutions? Fantastic. Thank you so much. I found that that's such an interesting point. And I, I found this whole event really interesting. Um, I hope everyone watching has too. Thank you so much for submitting all your questions through Slido. That was really, really helpful. And thank you so much to our brilliant speakers. You've been so interesting tonight. And I'm sure we're going to hear plenty more from you. Um, Thank you to UK and a Changing Europe. This is the last in this series of events uh, with Labour List and UK and a Changing Europe. We've explored Brexit and uh, Labour's approach to the economy and devolution. And I'm sure we'll work together again very soon. So um, thank you so much for everyone uh, joining tonight. And um, yeah, I, I'm sure we will do something together soon and you can join that too. So stay tuned and sign up to Labourless Morning Email, of course.